Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our service for those joining us in church and for those joining us online. Uh, just some notices to draw your attention to. Uh, firstly, Sunday School uh, and Ignite uh, go out during the singing of the first hymn. And then uh, we've got a short, short vestry meeting uh, in the committee room upstairs after the service. Uh, GFS and CLB tomorrow from 6.45 to 7.45. And then the ARC on Tuesday from 10 to 12 in the hall. Um, then vestry meeting Tuesday uh, at 8.30 again upstairs in the committee room. Uh, Wednesday uh, we'll have our Bible study at 8 o'clock, but we'll have tea and coffee will be at 20 to 8 instead of 8 o'clock, um, so that we can finish before 9. Um, so we have our choir practice at 9 o'clock in the church. A bowling club uh, on Thursday at 8 p.m. And then uh, there's the event, Remember, at St. Columbus Church, Oma, on Friday at 7.30, and you'll see details in your notice sheet our remembrance uh, service is on Sunday at 11 o'clock. That's a family service. And we'll be looking at love each other as I have loved you. And then confirmation class will be on Saturday the 19th of November from 5.30 to 7.30. And then that will be followed by Ignite. If you have any items for the food bank, then you can bring those along either to the church or to the rectory. And we'll make sure that they get to Enniskillen. Uh, there's uh, no uh, tea and coffee after the service uh, today as, uh, because of the, the vestry and also um, there's a funeral um, that I think uh, there's a number of people who'd like to get to that funeral later on this afternoon. So let's stand as we have our invitation to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, direct our thoughts, help us to pray, and lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Spirit of God fills the whole world. Come, let us worship. We begin our service by singing, My Hope is Built.
So we confess our sins to God our Father. Let us pray. And together we say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that has passed and grant that we may save you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the colic for the third Sunday before Advent. Almighty Father, whose will it is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nations, divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now Charles is going to come and read our reading. A reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace give us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. This is the word of the Lord. Before the sermon we sing how firm a foundation and strength will rise.
Let's pray. Father, I pray you take my lips and use them, that you'd speak through them for your name's sake and for your glory. Amen. Well, in this uh, season, as we lead up to Advent, we're looking at the Lord's return. And in this passage, and we see that it's important for us to understand, if you've got your, your sheet, you'll sort of see some notes there that will help you through the sermon. But we see that as we look at Acts and as we look at Acts 17, 1 to 10, that in Thessalonica, that Paul only spent three weeks. We, it says about him being at the synagogue for three Sabbaths. And then such opposition came that he left Thessalonica and went somewhere else. And so here he is then having planted a church in just three weeks. He then writes letters to them. And he writes two of them, and it's probably between A.D. 50 and A.D. 51, with there just being perhaps just weeks between each of these letters, because he wants this church to understand what it, what it means to be saved, what it means to be a Christian, and what it means to be prepared for the Lord's coming. And so if you read, the, the, if you read 1 Thessalonians, you'll see that it focuses on Jesus coming back and the fact that when he comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first because people were under the misunderstanding that that wouldn't happen. And so he teaches them what will happen, that, that the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive and are left, will be caught up together to meet, uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. But then what happens is that in between the first letter and the second letter, there were those who started to bring some false teaching in. By word, by prophecy, and even by a letter that was, they were saying was from Paul. And so briefly, we're going to look at three R's. The first thing is return. So Paul, understanding what had gone on, we read this in verses 1 to 2. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching from us, whether by, word, by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the Lord has already come. So that was the false teaching that was coming that because the church was undergoing such persecution, there were those who were teaching that they were already in what was called the tribulation, and that Jesus had already come again. And so what was happening was that people were even stopping working because they were expecting to be taken up already. They were stopping the things that they should have been doing. They were focusing on the wrong thing because of wrong teaching. In 2 Thessalonians 1.4, Paul refers to all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. So they were, because of persecution and trials, they were thinking, well, the Lord has come. And what was Paul saying? He's saying the Lord hasn't come yet. And there are certain signs that we will have, particularly he refers to this man of lawlessness, uh, that the Antichrist will come first. And if you read Revelations, there's a, a sp specific period of time where he will be allowed to basically to, to perform what he's doing on the earth until the Lord comes. But we shouldn't be focused so much on signs as we should be focused on the Lord. And in actual fact, what Paul says is that things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. And he says that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that things are going to get darker, so they're going to get darker before the light dawns. Before Jesus comes back, things are going to get worse. Jesus says that himself to the disciples before he goes to the cross, and he's speaking about the end times, he says this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. 
We need to understand that things are prophesied to get worse, to get darker. And what the Bible says is that unfortunately, because of what goes on in the world, that there are those who turn away from the faith, that there are those who abandon the faith, that there are those who their love grows cold. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, it says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That's the reality of what Paul tells the church here and of what we need to understand is to happen. Things are to, going to get darker. Things are going to get worse. Evil is going to be coming more and more prevalent in our world because that's what Jesus tells us. We need to be ready. We need to understand what is it then that Paul is saying that the church should do and that therefore we should do as Christians. The next R is remain. Understanding what is going to happen, we need to be those who remain faithful. And so he says, so after telling uh, them about what's going to happen and then reminding them about what God has done in their lives, that they're, that they're saved because of work of the Holy Spirit, Then he goes on to say, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. The things that Paul passed on to them when he was there for those short period of time and the things that he wrote in letters and the things that were passed on through other letters that would be circulating around the church, they were to hold on to those things. They were to hold on to the gospel, the good news. They were to make sure that that was something that they stood firm on. You to stand firm means that you're saying that you're not going to give any ground. You're going to stand where you are. Why do we stand firm? Because we know that what we're standing on is firm foundation. As long as we're standing on the truth, on the gospel, on the things that have been revealed by God, by His Spirit, and through Jesus, then that's a firm foundation. That's why Jesus says about the the wise builder is the one who builds their life by putting into practice what He said. That's the firm foundation. That's the place where we need to be. In Matthew 24, verse 13, which is the verse immediately after Jesus talking about the love of most will grow cold, he says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So we need to understand that it's important that it's not just how we begin that's important. So coming to faith, yes, is important, but if we don't remain faithful to the end, then it's no use. We need to be those who stand firm to the end because Jesus says they are the ones who will be saved. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 10 to 12, Paul warns Timothy about some of the things that can drive uh, people away from the faith. And in this passage, he talks about money and wealth. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. So when there are things around us that are likely to to take us away from the Lord, we need to look at the things in the Word of God that will help us to hold fast to God. We need to drive ourselves towards those things. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, not on the things around. As Paul says in Colossians, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And it's interesting when you look at the commandments that the commandments finish with coveting. And the opposite of coveting is being content. And the Bible's clear that when we are content, that stops us from going after the things that, as it says in in Timothy, will cause grief, 
will pierce our hearts. That we need to be those who are content. And so if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, it talks about contentment from verse 6 on. Before that verse that mostly is quoted so wrongly that people talk about money as the root of all evil, but it's not money, it's the love of money. Wealth can be dangerous if it consumes us. If we're not running after God first, then wealth has become our God. And what does Jesus say? We can't love God and money. We have to choose which one. And so we're to pursue the things that will cause us to be more Christ-like. Godliness, righteousness, those things are what we need to pursue. But in this passage, Paul talks about us there's that sense of us, what he's saying is we don't need to be afraid. Yes, even though things are going to get darker, because we know the one who has worked in our life before, and we know his love for us, therefore, we know that he can work in our lives now, and we know the bright future that he has in store for us. If we can hold on and hold fast to him, then we know that he will carry us through. And so, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6, 16, he says, May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. He reminds the Christians in Thessalonica about what God has done for them and why he did it. He did it for love, that he loves us. And because he loves us, he wants the best for us. And if he wants the best for us, then we need to come to him. We need to come to him every day, that he would guide us into the good things, that we would avoid every kind of evil, but we would hold to the good, is what it says in Thessalonians in another part. So if God worked in the past in our lives, and he was faithful in the past, then we can be sure that he'll be faithful in the future and in the present. The next thing is resources. So after saying, may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, he then says, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. When we recognize that it's in God that we get the strength that we need, He's the one who longs to provide us with everything, every good for our enjoyment. He's the one who wants to give us the strength by His Holy Spirit. So as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, and He was in John's Gospel, we see Him talking about the Holy Spirit. And He talks about the Holy Spirit, uh, the word is paraclete in the Greek. In other words, it's the one drawn alongside to help. And that's the Spirit. And he longs to help us, but unfortunately, a lot of the times, we don't ask for his help. We want to go, th- go on our own, in our own strength. And therefore, we don't have that sense of, as we've sang, of being um, lifted on wings like eagles. That's what happens when we hope in the Lord, isn't it? Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount on wings like eagles. They will run and not go where. They will walk but not be faint. But the opposite of that is true, that if we're not hoping in the Lord, then we will faint. We will fall. It's only in Him that we get the strength to go along each day. And we see Jesus at the, at the point in his, in his life when He was going, uh, heading towards the cross and in that garden, what does He do? He cries out to the Father. And even though he knows that his prayer, his request for the cup to be removed isn't going to be answered, what do we see? We see that angels come and strengthen him. I think sometimes we, we bypass that part, and we don't see that there are times when Jesus was strengthened, and if he needed that strength and, and he came to the Father for it, then how much more do we need the strength that he will provide? And so, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul, talking about standing firm again, he reminds the Christians in Ephesus, and the letter of Ephesians was a circular letter. So, this would have gone round to all the churches. 
and he talks about the armor of God. Verse 10, he says, Be strong in the Lord and, and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He reminds us that our battle is not against flesh and blood. The reason why we need God's strength it's not a battle that's with flesh and blood. We're in a spiritual battle. Therefore, we need spiritual weapons and spiritual armor, protection, if we're to stand. And so he goes on to say, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you see, see what that's talking about? As things get worse, then we need to come to God more. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And then he goes through the different things that we have to put on. So the breastplate of righteousness, it's covering our hearts, that we're reminded that we're not righteous because of our own doing, but because we're taking on the righteousness of Jesus if we accept what he did on the cross. Our minds are protected by, by the helmet of salvation, which we read in another part is about hope. So hope guards our minds, that we recognize that, there, that we have hope, that there is eternal life for those who remain faithful to the end. But we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. But the interesting one is the shield of faith. Because remember, as Paul was talking about this, he was looking at soldiers. He was looking at the guards who were guarding him in prison. And he knew what those soldiers were like. And it's almost like the, the Lord gave him a picture of the, what is in the physical can be also in the spiritual. The reason why the Romans were so good at conquering nations was that they worked together that they locked their shields so that they came with two shield wall towards the opponent army. And so it's talking about unity, that the shield of faith is not just something that we wield ourselves, but it's something that we come together as Christians. And that shield of faith, the interesting thing was that it was dipped in water. It was leather, and it was dipped in water, and that water then meant that when a fiery arrow hit it, it went out. So what does is, what is Paul say in Ephesians 6? He says, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. When we come to the Lord, when we rely on His strength, then we can resist the devil. We can be those who, even though things get much, much worse, we end up being brighter and shine brighter rather than getting dark like the world. That we that are those who stand firm to the end. And in conclusion, Philippians 1.27, Paul talking to the Philippian church, he talks about this unity. And he says this, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. You see how many of the letters and how many of the things are talking about standing firm. But then he goes on to say, stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So it is obvious from the whole of the New Testament that to be a Christian is not something you do on your own. It's something that you can only do and you can only stand firm and hold to the teaching when you rely on God and when we rely on each other. When we see that fellowship is one of the most important things that we have, that when we don't do that, then to use another analogy, we have what it talks about in 1 Peter, about resisting the devil. He says that the devil is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What does a lion do? If you've seen on TV 
uh, David Attenborough, time and time again, a lion will get one on its own, and that's the one it will go, and that's the one it will kill. And that's what Satan longs to do. He longs to try and get us to believe that fellowship is not important, so he can get us out on, his, out on our own, and then he can destroy us, because that's what he is about. As, as Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, which is what he is, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the fill. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your deep love for us, that we're reminded in this passage about what you have done for us and what you have in store for us if we stand firm to the end. Lord, we pray that today you'd help us, that, Lord, that we would make that decision to prioritize things in our life that will help us to be those who do stand firm to the end that you'd help us, Lord, to rely on you and to rely on one another, that in our fellowship we would grow strong, that we would be lights in the darkness and salt in the earth. And all for your glory. Amen. So in response, we sing by faith.
remain standing and we affirm our faith. To believe and trust in God the Father. I believe and trust in God the Father who made the world. To believe and trust in God the Son. I believe and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind. To believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit. I believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the church worldwide that we all may be one. Grant that every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that your glory may be proclaimed through our lives. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word forewarns us of persecution, opposition, and suffering. Please equip us by your Holy Spirit to stand firm on our Christian faith. Despite earthly suffering remind us, reminding us that though such suffering is real and painful, it is but for a moment, that not to be compared with eternal glory that awaits all those who stand firm. May your word keep us from both false hope and faithless despair. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in Muslim majority Kazakhstan, where only 25% of the population are Christians, and where Christians from a Muslim background have often been viewed with suspicion and distrust. As the growing sense of Kazakh nationalism, which is linked to an Islamic identity, is leading to increased hostility against all Christians. We pray for our brothers and sisters may be strong in faith and in unity, and that through the practical outworking of their faith, they may see your kingdom come even more in their nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for Heather Ellis, as she is commissioned today as diocesan president of Clocher Mothers Union, that you may strengthen, encourage, and guide her in her new role. We pray too for Bishop Ian and the family, that you would comfort them in the loss of Bishop Ian's mother who passed away on Tuesday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in need of your touch, and in the silence we bring them to your throne of grace, especially remembering the Morton, McLean, and Stuart families. Together we say, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand to bring healing to those who are sick, comfort to those who are and hope to those who are Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who are
have our closing prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you emptied yourself, taking the form of a servant. Through your love, make us servants of one another. Lord Jesus Christ, for our sake, you became poor. May our lives and gifts enrich the life of your world. And we say together, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. So we turn to one Lord, we say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So every blessing, uh, Lorna and Beatrice are going to play us out. Mm -hmm.